Now, normally this is the point where the dean introduces the Meyer Lecture. This year, however, we'll depart from that tradition in order to acknowledge a special relationship which both our seminary and our lecturer have with Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Mungaline has collaborated with Trinity for over 40 years, both in the Association of Chicago Theological Schools and particularly in the North Chicago Theological Institute. So we asked the president, Dr. David Dockery, to send a representative to introduce the lecturer who is both an alumnus and a former faculty member of Trinity. So I am pleased to introduce Dr. Harold Netland, Professor of Philosophy of Religions and Intercultural Studies to make that introduction. Well, thank you so much, Father Bema. It is a real honor for me to be with you tonight on the uh, first evening of the uh, lecture series. And uh, I do bring very warm greetings from uh, Dr. David Dockery, uh, the president of Trinity International University, and from Dr. Graham Cole, uh, the dean at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And I know I speak for the faculty and the administration when I say that we are really very grateful uh, for the warm relationship between our two schools and the collaboration that we've been able to uh, have on a number of matters. Uh, personally, um, it's been a joy and a privilege for me to work with Father Bema uh, for the last few years in the fall global theology course that the NCTI offers. And it's a real treat for me to be able to uh, introduce the speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. William Lane Craig. Uh, Dr. Craig is a uh, theologian, a philosopher, an apologist, and an evangelist. And if you stop and think about it, that's a very unusual combination. Uh, you don't often find those all in one person. Uh, Bill Craig moves very easily from highly technical debates in philosophical theology or cosmology to very simple presentations of the gospel of Jesus, seamlessly, effortlessly. Uh, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Uh, Dr. Craig is a graduate of Wheaton College, and he has two earned master's degrees uh, at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And as mentioned, he served as a faculty member teaching in philosophy of religion from 1980 to 1986. Uh, he is certainly one of Trinity's most distinguished alumni, and we're proud of him. Dr. Craig has two earned doctoral degrees, one in philosophy from the University of Birmingham in England, and one in theology from the University of Munich. Uh, he is currently research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in California, and also professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University in Texas. Uh, I'm not quite sure if he has the attribute of omnipresence, but he probably comes pretty close. He and his wife, Jan, have two grown children. Uh, Professor Craig has authored or edited over 30 books and has published over 100 articles in journals such as the Journal of Philosophy, New Testament Studies, and the British Journal of Philosophy of Science. I would also call your attention to uh, Dr. Craig's website, uh, reasonable Faith, uh, which can be accessed at reasonablefaith.org, and that's reasonablefaith, one word, dot org. You'll find on the website a complete list of his publications, uh, debates, as well as ongoing discussions um, that he's having. Now, here's the most important thing about Bill Craig. Bill Craig loves the Lord Jesus Christ and he is passionate about other people also coming to know and to love Jesus. Will you join me tonight in welcoming Dr. William Lane Craig as our speaker this evening? 
Thank you very much. It is a distinct honor to be invited to give the Meyer Lectures here at St. Mary's. And it was with a bit of nostalgia, I have to say, that we drove onto the campus yesterday. It reminded me of when my wife Jan and I were students at Trinity and used to drive up to St. Mary's on the lake just to walk around the beautiful grounds here uh, and experience the loveliness of your campus. I remember that we thought when we saw this place, why couldn't Trinity own this campus? <laughs> so it's, it's really wonderful to be back again after all these decades. I must say, however, that experiencing this uh, weather here reminds me of why we moved to Atlanta. <laughs> Some Atlanta students here, I know. Well, I've been asked to uh, speak on uh, the topics of what philosophy offers to the new evangelization and um, also on the evangelization on university campuses. And so tonight, I want to address that first topic of what philosophy offers to the new evangelization. Near the end of his wide-ranging encyclical, Fides et Ratio, on the relationship between faith and reason, and in particular philosophy, John Paul II declared that the church considers philosophy an indispensable help with respect to two tasks. First, for a deeper understanding of faith, and second, for communicating the truth of the gospel to those who do not yet know it. With respect to this second task, he spoke of the pressing need for a new evangelization, and he appealed specifically to philosophers to aid in this endeavor. The Pope believed that philosophy has a fundamental and original contribution to make in service of the new evangelization. This is partly because, as he put it, philosophical thought is often the only ground for understanding and dialogue with those who do not share our faith. Philosophy offers a common ground on which we can engage non-Christians. Moreover, philosophy, the Pope said, is the mirror which reflects the culture of a people. So, he concluded, a philosophy which evolves in harmony with faith is part of that evangelization of culture which Paul VI proposed as one of the fundamental goals of evangelization. In 2010, Pope Benedict XVI officially established the Pontifical Council for promoting the new evangelization. The Pope believed it of utmost importance that traditionally Christian nations, especially in Europe and North America, which have become shaped by a culture of secularism, be re-evangelized. I share the Pope's conviction and believe that Christian philosophy will have, and indeed is having, a vital role in the evangelization of culture. Decisive changes are taking place in the field of philosophy, and the outcome of these changes will reverberate throughout the university and ultimately Western culture. Christian philosophers are significantly changing the current face of Anglo-American philosophy. Indeed, it is no exaggeration, I think, to speak of a renaissance of Christian philosophy over the last generation. In order to understand where we are today, we need, first of all, to understand something of where we have been. In a recent retrospective, the eminent Princeton University philosopher, Paul Benassaraf, describes what it was like doing philosophy at Princeton during the 1950s and 60s. The overwhelmingly dominant mode of thinking 
was scientific naturalism. Physical science was taken to be the final and really only arbiter of truth. Metaphysics, that traditional branch of philosophy which deals with questions about reality which are beyond science, hence metaphysics, beyond physics, metaphysics had been vanquished expelled from philosophy like an unclean leper. The philosophy of science, says Benassaraf, was the queen of all the branches of philosophy since it had the tools to address all the questions. Any problem that could not be addressed by science was simply dismissed as a pseudo problem. If a question did not have a scientific answer, then it was not a real question, just a pseudo question masquerading as a real question. Indeed, part of the task of philosophy was to clean up the discipline from the mess that earlier generations had made of it by endlessly struggling with such pseudo questions. There was thus a certain self-conscious, crusading zeal with which the philosophers carried out their task. The reformers, says Benassaraf, trumpeted the militant affirmation of the new faith in which the fumbling confusions of our forebears were to be replaced by the emerging science of philosophy. This new enlightenment would put the old metaphysical views and attitudes to rest and replace them with the new mode of doing philosophy. The book Language, Truth, and Logic by the British philosopher A.J. Eyre served as a sort of manifesto of this movement. As Benassaraf says, it was not a great book, but it was a wonderful exponent of the spirit of the time. The principal weapon employed by Eyre in his campaign against metaphysics was the vaunted verification principle of meaning. According to that principle, which went through a number of revisions, a sentence, in order to be meaningful, must be capable, in principle, of being empirically verified. Since metaphysical statements were beyond the reach of empirical science, they could not be verified and were therefore dismissed as meaningless combinations of words. Eyre was very explicit about the theological implications of this verificationism. Since God is a metaphysical object, Eyre says, the possibility of religious knowledge is ruled out by our treatment of metaphysics. Thus, there can be no knowledge of God. Now, Someone might say that we can offer evidence of God's existence, but Eyre will have none of it. If by the word God you mean a transcendent being, says Eyre, then the word God is a metaphysical word, and so it cannot be even probable that a God exists. He explains, to say that God exists is to make a metaphysical utterance which cannot be either true or false. And by the same criterion, no sentence which purports to describe the nature of a transcendent God can possess any literal significance. Suppose some Christian says, but I know God through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't deny my personal experience. Air is not impressed. He would not think to deny that you have an experience, he says, any more than he would deny that someone has an experience of, say, seeing a yellow colored object. But, he says, whereas the sentence, there exists here a yellow colored material thing, expresses a genuine proposition which could be empirically verified, the sentence there exists a transcendent God, has no literal significance because it is not verifiable. 
Thus, the appeal to religious experience, says Ayer, is altogether fallacious. I hope you grasp the significance of this view. On this perspective, statements about God do not even have the dignity of being false. They are devoid of any factual content and so can be neither true nor false. Ask yourself how sympathetic a university community dominated by such a philosophical outlook would be toward theistic faculty and students. And it wasn't just metaphysical statements that were regarded as meaningless. Ethical statements, statements about right and wrong, good and evil, were also declared to be meaningless. Why? Because they can't be empirically verified. Such statements are simply emotional expressions of the user's feelings. Ayer says, if I say stealing money is wrong, I produce a statement which has no factual meaning. It is as if I had written stealing money. It is clear that there is nothing here which can be true or false. So he concludes that value judgments have no objective validity whatsoever. Now think of what that implies. It becomes impossible to declare such things as terrorism, school shootings, or intolerance as objectively evil. The same goes for aesthetic judgments regarding beauty and ugliness. According to Ayer, such aesthetic words as beautiful and hideous are employed not to make statements of fact, but simply to express certain feelings. On this view, there is no aesthetic difference between the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel and the ceiling in my house. It's sobering to realize that this was the sort of thinking that dominated the departments of philosophy at British and American universities during the last century into the 1960s. And it was not without its impact on religious life. Under the pressure of verificationism, some theologians began to advocate emotivist theories of theological language. On their view, theological statements are not statements of fact at all, but merely express the user's emotions and attitudes. For example, the sentence, God created the world, does not purport to make any factual statement at all, but is merely a way of expressing, say, one's awe and well, wonder at the grandeur of the universe. The low point undoubtedly came with the so-called death of God theology of the mid-1960s. On April 8, 1966, Time magazine carried a cover which was completely black except for three words emblazoned in bright red letters against the dark background. And the words read, is God dead? And the article described the movement then current among American theologians to proclaim the death of God. Today, that movement has all but disappeared. What happened? What happened is a remarkable story. Philosophers exposed an incoherence which lay at the very heart of the prevailing philosophy of scientific naturalism. They began to realize that the verification principle would force us to dismiss not only theological statements as meaningless, but also a great many scientific statements so that the principle undermined the sacred cow of science at whose altar they knelt. Contemporary physics is filled with metaphysical statements that cannot be empirically verified. 
As the eminent philosopher of science, Bas von Frassen, nicely puts it, do the concepts of the Trinity and the soul baffle you? They pale beside the unimaginable otherness of closed space-times, event horizons, EPR correlations, and bootstrap models. If the ship of scientific naturalism was not to be scuttled, verificationism had to be cut loose. But even more fundamentally, it was also realized that verification principle is self-refuting. Simply ask yourself, is the sentence, quote, a meaningful sentence must be capable in principle of being empirically verified, end quote, itself capable of being empirically verified? Well, obviously not. No amount of empirical evidence could serve to verify its truth. The verification principle is therefore, by its own lights, a meaningless combination of words, which need hardly detain us, or, at best, an arbitrary definition, which we are at liberty to reject. Therefore, the verification principle and the theory of meaning it supported has been almost universally abandoned by philosophers. Undoubtedly, the most important philosophical event of the 20th century was the collapse of the verificationism which lay at the heart of scientific naturalism. One result of this collapse has been the rise of postmodernism. Scientific naturalism originating in the Enlightenment is characteristic of so-called modernity, or the modern age, which is dominated by science and technology. The collapse of verificationism brought with it a sort of disillusionment with the whole Enlightenment project of scientific naturalism. This might seem, at first blush, a welcome development for Christian believers, weary of attacks by Enlightenment naturalists. But in this case, the cure is worse than the disease. For postmodernists have tended to despair of ever finding objective truth and knowledge. After all, if science, man's greatest intellectual achievement, cannot do so, then what hope is there? Hence, postmodernists have tended to deny that there are universal standards of logic, rationality, and truth. This claim is obviously incompatible with the Christian idea of God, who, as the creator and sustainer of all things, is an objectively existing reality, and who, as an omniscient being, has a privileged perspective on the world, grasping the world as it is in the unity of his intellect. There is thus a unity and objectivity to truth, which is incompatible with postmodernism. Postmodernists, therefore, often see their task as implicitly anti theological. For example, the literary critic Roland Barthes has written, to give a text an author is to impose a limit on that text, to furnish it a final significance, to close the writing. In precisely this way, literature, by refusing to assign an ultimate meaning to the text and to the world as text, liberates what may be called an anti-theological activity, an activity that is truly revolutionary, since to refuse meaning is, in the end, to refuse God and his hypostases, reason, science, law. Postmodernism is therefore no more friendly to Christian truth claims than is enlightenment naturalism. Christianity is reduced to but one voice in a cacophony of competing claims, none of which is objectively true. Enlightenment naturalism is, however, so deeply embedded in Western intellectual life 
that anti-rationalistic currents like romanticism and now postmodernism are doomed, I think, to be mere passing fashions. After all, nobody adopts a postmodernist view of literary texts when reading uh, the labels on a medicine bottle or a box of rat poison. Clearly, we ignore the objective meaning of such texts only at peril to our lives. In the end, people turn out to be uh, subjectivists only about ethics and religion, not about matters provable by science. But that's not postmodernism. That's just classic Enlightenment naturalism. It's the old modernism in a fashionable new guise. Underneath the costume, it's the same old subjectivism and relativism that were characteristic of modernity's view of religion and ethics. Fortunately, postmodernism is not the only result of the collapse of verificationism. Since verificationism had been the principal means of barring the door to metaphysics, the jettisoning of verificationism meant that there was no longer anyone at the door to prevent this dreaded and unwelcome visitor from making a reappearance. So the demise of verificationism has been accompanied by a resurgence of metaphysics in Anglo-American philosophy, along with all the other traditional questions of philosophy which had been suppressed by the verificationists. Along with this resurgence has come something new and altogether unexpected, the birth of a new discipline, philosophy of religion, and a renaissance of Christian philosophy. Since the late 1960s, Christian philosophers have been coming out of the closet and defending the truth of the Christian worldview with philosophically sophisticated arguments in the finest scholarly journals and professional societies. And the face of Anglo-American philosophy has been transformed as a result. At the same time that the theologians were writing God's obituary, a new generation of philosophers was rediscovering his vitality. Just a few years after its infamous death of God issue, Time ran a follow-up cover story. Only this time, the question read, is God coming back to life? That's how it must have seemed to those theological morticians of the 1960s. During the 1970s, interest in philosophy of religion continued to grow. And in 1980, Time found itself running another major story entitled Modernizing the Case for God, in which it described the movement among contemporary philosophers to refurbish the traditional arguments for God's existence. Time marveled in a quiet revolution in thought and argument that hardly anybody could have foreseen only two decades ago, God is making a comeback. Most intriguingly, this is happening not among theologians or ordinary believers, but in the crisp intellectual circles of academic philosophers, where the consensus had long banished the Almighty from fruitful discourse. According to the article, the noted American philosopher Roderick Chisholm believed the reason that atheism was so influential a generation ago is that the brightest philosophers were atheists. But now, he says, many of the brightest philosophers are theists, and they are using a tough-minded intellectualism in defense of that belief that was formerly lacking on their side of the debate. So, I'm pleased to tell you that today some of England and America's finest philosophers at our leading universities 
are outspoken Christians. I think, for example, of Richard Swinburne and Brian Leftow at Oxford University, Robert Adams and Dean Zimmerman at Rutgers, Peter Van Inwagen and Alvin Plantinga at Notre Dame, Trenton Merricks at Virginia, Timothy O'Connor at Indiana, Eleanor Stump at St. Louis. The list goes on and on. Today, philosophy of religion flourishes in young professional journals, such as the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion, Religious Studies, Sophia, Faith and Philosophy, Philosophia Christi, and American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly, and other journals devoted to the discipline, not to mention the standard non-specialist journals. Professional societies, such as the Society of Christian Philosophers, the Evangelical Philosophical Society, the American Catholic Philosophical Society, not to mention other smaller groups, number thousands of members. Publishing in philosophy of religion is booming, as is evident from the abundance of available textbooks. Also, testimony to the seemingly insatiable interest among students for courses on the subject. If you peruse the current book catalog of Oxford University Press, you will find no less than 50 new books in philosophy of religion. That compares with 28 in metaphysics, 39 in epistemology, 31 in applied ethics, and so on. But you may ask, what about the so-called new atheism, exemplified by Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Christopher Hitchens? Doesn't it herald a reversal of this trend? Not really. As evident from the authors the new atheists interact with, or rather do not interact with, the new atheism is in fact a pop cultural phenomenon, lacking in intellectual muscle and blissfully ignorant of the revolution that has taken place in Anglo-American philosophy. It tends to reflect the positivism of a bygone generation, rather than the contemporary intellectual scene. The positivistic roots of much of the anti-theological diatribes of scientists like Lawrence Krauss, Stephen Hawking, and Neil deGrasse Tyson are plainly evident in their rejection of the entire discipline of philosophy, a throwback to the sort of attitude described by Benassaraf during the mid-20th century. The physicist Carlo Rovelli says bluntly, they are stupid in this. The greatest scientists of all times read philosophy, learned from philosophy, and could never have done the great science they did without the input they got from philosophy. Scientists who talk philosophy down are simply superficial, end quote. Though influential in popular culture, the new atheism is shallow and uninformed. To give you some feel for the revolution in Anglo-American philosophy, I want to quote now at some length from an article by Quentin Smith, which appealed, appeared in the fall of 2001 in the secularist journal Philo, lamenting what Smith called the de-secularization of academia that evolved in philosophy departments since the late 1960s. Smith, himself a prominent atheist philosopher, writes, by the second half of the 20th century, universities had become in the main secularized. The standard position in each field assumed or involved arguments for a naturalist worldview. Departments of theology or religion aimed to understand the meaning and origins of religious writings, not to develop arguments against naturalism. Analytic philosophers treated theism as an anti-realist or non-cognitivist worldview, requiring the reality not of a deity, but merely of emotive expressions or certain forms of life. This is not to say 
that none of the scholars in the various academic fields were realist theists in their private lives, but realist theists, for the most part, excluded their theism from their publications and teaching, in large part because theism was mainly considered to have such low epistemic status that it did not meet the standards of an academically respectable position to hold. The secularization of mainstream academia began to quickly unravel upon the publication of Plantinga's influential book, God and Other Minds, in 1967. It became apparent to the philosophical profession that this book displayed that realist theists were not outmatched by naturalists in terms of the most valued standards of analytic philosophy, conceptual precision, rigor of argumentation, technical erudition, and an in-depth defense of an original worldview. This book, followed seven years later by Plantinga's even more impressive book, The Nature of Necessity, made it manifest that a realist theist was writing at the highest qualitative level of analytic philosophy on the same playing field as Carnap, Russell, Moore, Grunbaum, and other naturalists. Naturalists passively watched as realist versions of theism, most influenced by Plantinga's writings, began to sweep through the philosophical community until today, perhaps one quarter or one third of philosophy professors are theists, with most being Orthodox Christians. Although many theists do not work in the area of philosophy of religion, so many of them do work in this area that there are now over five philosophy journals devoted to theism or the philosophy of religion. Theists in other fields tend to compartmentalize their theistic beliefs from their scholarly work. They rarely assume and never argue for theism in their scholarly work. If they did, they would be committing academic suicide, or more exactly, their articles would be quickly rejected. But in philosophy, it became almost overnight academically respectable to argue for theism, making philosophy a favored field of entry for the most intelligent and talented theists entering academia today. Smith concludes, God is not dead in academia. He returned to life in the late 1960s and is now alive and well in his last academic stronghold, philosophy departments. This is the testimony of a prominent atheist philosopher to the transformation that has taken place before his eyes in Anglo-American philosophy. Now, I think he's exaggerating when he estimates that one quarter to one third of American philosophers are theists, but what his estimations do reveal is the perceived impact of Christian philosophers upon this field. As all revolutionaries know, a committed minority of activists can have an impact far out of proportion to their numbers. The number of Christians among graduate students in philosophy is estimated to be 50% higher than among current faculty, which suggests that the revolution will continue. Atheism, though perhaps still the dominant viewpoint at the Western University, is a philosophy in retreat. The principal error that Smith makes is calling philosophy departments God's last stronghold at the university. On the contrary, it is a beachhead from which to launch forays into other disciplines at the university. Since every discipline at the university has at its foundation a philosophical component, such as philosophy of education, philosophy of science, philosophy of law, even philosophy of sport, <laughs> 
we can, if we can affect philosophy, we can change the whole university. This is vital because the single most important institution shaping Western culture is the university. It is at the university that our future political leaders, our journalists, our lawyers, our teachers, our business executives, our artists will be trained. It is at the university that they will formulate or more likely simply absorb the worldview that will shape their lives. And since these are the opinion makers and leaders who shape our culture, the world view that they imbibe at the university will be the one that shapes our culture. If we change the university, we change culture through those who shape culture. If the Christian worldview can be restored to a place of prominence and respect at the university, it will have a leavening effect throughout society. Why is this important? Simply because the gospel is never heard in isolation. It is always heard against the background of the cultural milieu in which one lives. A person raised in a cultural milieu in which Christianity is still seen as an intellectually viable option will display an openness to the gospel, which a person who is secularized will not. For the secular person, you may as well tell him to believe in fairies or leprechauns as in Jesus Christ. Or to see the impact of culture in your own life Imagine a devotee of the Hare Krishna movement approaching you on the street as they used to do, offering you a flower and inviting you to believe in Krishna. Such an invitation would likely strike you as bizarre, freakish, perhaps even amusing. But to a person on the streets of Mumbai, such an invitation would, I assume, appear quite reasonable and be serious cause for reflection. I fear that Christians appear almost as weird to persons on the streets of Bonn, Stockholm, and Paris as do the devotees of Krishna. What awaits us in North America, if our slide into secularism continues unabated, is already evident in Europe. Although the majority of Europeans retain a nominal affiliation with Christianity, only about 10% are practicing believers, and less than half of those are biblical in their theology. The most significant trend in European religious affiliation is the growth of those classed as non-religious from effectively 0% of the population in 1900 to over 22% today. As a result, evangelization is immeasurably more difficult in Europe than in the United States. Having lived for 13 years in Europe, where I spoke evangelistically on university campuses across the continent, I can testify personally to how hard the ground is. It's difficult for the gospel even to get a hearing. For example, I recall vividly that when I spoke at the University of Porto in Portugal, the students were so incredulous at the prospect of a Christian intellectual with two earned doctoral degrees from European universities that they suspected that I was actually an imposter, a fake. They even telephoned the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium where I was a visiting researcher to confirm my affiliation with the university. The United States is following at some distance down this same road with Canada somewhere in between. Canada's slide into secularism has been precipitous. My experience speaking on university campuses across Canada suggests to me that Canada embodies a sort of mid-Atlantic culture further along the road toward European secularism than its southern neighbor. 
pluralism and relativism are the conventional wisdom at Canadian universities. Political correctness and laws regulating speech stifle debate on issues of ethical importance and serve as weapons to oppress Christian ideas and institutions. I have been prohibited from speaking on certain Canadian university campuses on any topic simply because of my personal belief that marriage is essentially a heterosexual relationship. Canada's slide into secularism illustrates how important maintaining a cultural milieu sympathetic to Christian belief is to the effectiveness of evangelization. Fortunately, during the last decade or so, Canadian Christians have begun to reverse this slide. But the climb back will be vastly more difficult than the downward slide because it will be in the teeth of a culture which has come to oppose the Christian worldview. As John Paul II understood, it is the task of Christian philosophy to help create and sustain a cultural milieu in which the gospel can be heard as an intellectually viable option for thinking men and women. The point I want to make is that the task of desecularization is not hopeless or impossible, nor need significant changes take as long to achieve as one might think. What is going on in Christian philosophy today represents the best hope for the transformation of culture that the Pope envisioned, and its true impact for the cause of Christ will be felt only in the next generation as it filters down into popular culture. Speaking recently at Rutgers University, I was stunned when a Christian, or rather, when a student in the audience stood up during the Q&A following my talk and said, I want to thank Christian philosophers like you for making it easy for me to be a Christian. As a result of the work of Christian philosophers, genuine advance has been made on important issues like the epistemic status of belief in God, the coherence of theism, and the problem of evil, so that questions which dominated earlier discussions have been resolved or have yielded to new questions. For example, the so-called presumption of atheism, which so dominated mid-20th century philosophy of religion, according to which atheism is a sort of default position is now a relic of the past. Similarly, scarcely any philosopher today defends the so-called logical version of the problem of evil, which claims that God and the suffering in the world are logically incompatible. The discussion of the coherence of theism, which analyzes the principal attributes traditionally ascribed to God, such as aseity, necessity, eternity, omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence has been an especially fertile field of exploration. My own philosophical work has focused on the coherence of theism, yielding in-depth analyses and defenses of the coherence of divine omniscience, particularly God's middle knowledge and foreknowledge of contingent events, divine eternity, including God's relationship to time and its connection to physical time as described in the special and general theories of relativity, and divine aseity in dialogue with the challenge posed by Platonism with respect to abstract objects, such as numbers, sets, and other mathematical objects. The renaissance of Christian philosophy has not been merely defensive, however. It has also been accompanied by a resurgence of interest in natural theology, that branch of theology which seeks to provide evidence for God's existence 
apart from the resources of authoritative divine revelation. All of the traditional arguments for God's existence, such as the cosmological, teleological, moral, and ontological arguments, not to mention creative new arguments, find intelligent and articulate defenders on the contemporary philosophical scene. I have personally defended in print and public debate the argument from contingency for a metaphysically necessary being, the Kalam cosmological argument for a personal creator of the universe, the teleological argument from fine tuning for a cosmic designer, the moral argument for a personally embodied good, the ontological argument for a maximally great being, along with arguments from the applicability of mathematics and from intentionality for a transcendent personal mind, as well as the proper basicality of belief in God wholly apart from arguments. Of course, there are replies and counter replies to all of these arguments, and no one imagines that a consensus will be reached. But theists welcome this debate, for the very presence of the debate is itself a sign of how healthy and vibrant a theistic worldview is today. To return in closing to John Paul II's words, I quote, philosophical thought is often the only ground for understanding and dialogue with those who do not share our faith. The current ferment in philosophy demands of believing philosophers an attentive and competent commitment, able to discern the expectations, the points of openness, and the key issues of this historical moment. Reflecting in the light of reason and in keeping with its rules, and guided always by the deeper understanding given them by the word of God, Christian philosophers can develop a reflection which will be both comprehensible and appealing to those who do not yet grasp the full truth which divine revelation declares." End quote. I believe that the new evangelization can succeed, that culture can be changed. Christian philosophers are currently carrying out the task to which the new evangelization calls them. May God continue to raise up a mighty force of committed men and women to transform the university and hence Western culture in such a way that the gospel may be heard afresh in all of its life-changing power.